We've all seen examples of augmented reality, virtual images that are overlapped with real-time world observations in order to offer more information about an object, location, or both. However, did you know that augmented reality does not have to be only visual? In this ninth session of our extended reality lecture series, we will explore current augmented reality interpretations in order to find out what is the best definition for it. In order to answer this question, we have to discuss the current context behind augmented reality, which is given in this reality virtuality continuum by Milgram and Kishino, which we have covered in our extended reality session. In it, augmented reality is defined as a part of the virtual continuum that offers less virtual and more realistic objects. Therefore, the emphasis is placed on the visual criteria. This is understandable as most of our perception of the real environment is governed by the information we gather through our visual cortex. We observe the real environment through a specific light interaction with the matter that we mimic within the graphics rendering pipeline. So, since we know how to imitate the world around us within computer-generated imagery, we can create realistic images as the visual stimuli in order to provide an augmented experience of reality. However, the definition cannot be that simple, especially when we take into consideration other criteria apart from the visual, such as the reproduction fidelity or immersion, as well as interaction. This is why we have to consider if there is something in between the real environment and the augmented reality. In order to explore this question, we can turn our attention to Xerox, an American corporation that has been selling print and digital document products and services for over 100 years. Since the 1938, when the first viable printing process was invented, Xerox has had a monopoly on the market. However, Xerox could not keep the monopoly for long, as in 1959, their patents ran out, which meant that other markets in less developing countries could use the technology to develop their printing machines and image capturing equipment. At this time, Jack Goldman was appointed as the head of the research and development at Xerox to try and upgrade the products and services that Xerox had in order to bring the monopoly back to them. This is why in 1969, the Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC for short, was founded as a division of Xerox tasked with creating computer technology related products and hardware systems. This is where the PARC members were working on inventions that we still use today, such as the computer mouse, the Ethernet connection, and graphics user interface, or GUI. Even though we consider these things to be irreplaceable in contemporary times, the upper management of Xerox did not find these products and inventions financially viable, and hence did not develop an interest in researching it further. Therefore, the main result of these inventions, the Xerox Alto, which had all these products integrated, cost a whopping $32,000, which is around $130,000 nowadays, which is why out of the 2,000 items that were produced, there was not much interest in selling them. However, one good thing that the Xerox upper management had understanding for was the dissemination of knowledge, which is why they allowed people to visit Park and get acquainted with the latest achievements in technology. It is known that Steve Jobs visited this facility in 1969, which is when he saw the graphics user interface and decided to implement it into his product, even though the implementation was expensive and ill-advised by his peers and could have cost him his company. There's also the question of whether Bill Gates stole the GUI concept from Steve Jobs, where the most common defense is, well, Steve, I think there's more than one way of looking at it. I think it's more like we both had this rich neighbor named Xerox, and I broke into his house to steal a TV set and found out that you had already stolen it. But the main focus of this story is not on the GUI, but on the prominence of researchers to say that they are working on something much larger in order to continue developing the interconnection of computers using the Ethernet cable, which is where we have to introduce the concept of ubiquitous computing or UbiComp. One of the main researchers of this topic was Mark Weiser, who authored a paper entitled The Computer for the 21st Century back in 1991 where he talked about the interconnectivity of computers and sensors happening in the background, hidden from view of us as the users. It basically means the computer is made to appear anytime and everywhere. The underlying technology that supports ubiquitous computing is mainly internet connection, which is why we have to discuss various ways of human computer interconnectivity through several waves that have occurred throughout history and that are present now. The zeroth wave is when there are still no physical computers, but there is a concept of computability, more precisely the Church-Turing thesis about the nature of computable functions. 
It states that a function on the natural numbers can be calculated by an effective method if and only if it is computable by a Turing machine. It is important to grasp that this is still an abstract construct by the time of 1930s and 1940s, which is why we can start talking about the first wave of computers during the 1960s and 1970s. During this time, computers were only available to large corporations that required advanced calculation methods for their specific needs, such as weather forecast, missile trajectory, stock fluctuations, and similar. In this case, we have multiple people working on one computer, which given its size required a lot of power to run. The amount of power that could power a small town of 30,000 people. As technology was advancing, we experienced a second wave of computers and their interconnectivity with people during the 1980s and 1990s, when the age of the personal computers emerged, which meant that each person had a computer of their own. This is mostly due to the components and the hardware becoming smaller and being portable enough to place on a desk. Finally, we have reached the third wave where the computers got even smaller, transferring the emphasis from who has a computer to what happens to the information that is being exchanged between the computer and the people. By that time, the computers have gotten so small that they have effectively gone from our sight and blended into the background, seamlessly working and calculating without us even having to request it, as is the example with the automatic rotate function. At this stage, one person has multiple computers that are all interconnected and communicate the information between themselves and to the users. Which begs the question, what comes after the third wave? Some speculate that at this time, multiple people will be linked to multiple smart devices, but the information will have a controlled flow by a large corporation entrepreneurship that governs the information to specific people and not to all. Corporations that generate cloud services allow for the information to be used to benefit the users without so much endangering their private data, as is the case with traffic jams that can be seen in Google Maps, which works by using the GPS data of users and letting you know if a lot of people are experiencing slowdowns. This phenomenon of interconnectivity can be explained by introducing the term Internet of Things, which describes devices with sensors processing ability, software, and other technologies that connect and exchange data with other devices and systems over the internet or other communication networks. One such example is present in autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars, where we can see a case of the Tesla car taking information from its surrounding in order to process whether there are obstacles ahead. In this case, the car did not stop and instead crashed into the truck in front. Caused by a processing malfunction of various information derived from the sensors that can be found on most self-driving cars, such as the ultrasound, the radar, LIDAR, or the light detection and ranging, and the use of raster images acquired by cameras. Similar sensors and consequential responses exist in smart homes where light detection causes the blinds to open or close, temperature drops cause the heating to engage, and specific time of the day can cause the lighting in the room to dim. These two aspects, the ubiquitous computing and the Internet of Things, is essential for the existence of augmented reality. However, even though there are prerequisites for augmented reality, this does not explain what augmented reality is. So in order to explore this topic, we have to do a quick overview of important terms, starting with the two important concepts that are shared with the camera and the human sight. The first one is the focal length. As a fundamental parameter of a lens that describes how strongly it focuses or diverges light. A large focal length indicates that light is bent gradually, while a short focal length indicates that the light is bent at sharp angles. The second one is the depth of field, described as the distance between the nearest and the furthest objects that are in acceptable sharp focus in an image captured with a camera. By combining these two features, we can divert our attention to something that is closer or further away from us, keeping it in focus and blurring all the rest. The same features of the camera are present in the human eye, apart from the ability to change the focal distance. But the same problem remains in both, the inability to focus on multiple depths of field at the same time. In this book, The Practical Augmented Reality, this problem is addressed in an example dating back to 1901 where a patent was filled by Irish telescope maker, Sir Howard Grubb, describing a device intended for use in helping aim projectile firing weapons. In the patent, he specifies, 
Now the site which forms the subject of this paper attains a similar result not by projecting an actual spot of light or an image on the object, but by projecting what is called in optical language, a virtual image upon it. However, in this case, we are only dealing with real images becoming virtual in our head, as we've discussed in our first lecture series by using the concept of overlapping images. However, the question remains, do these images need to be digital in order to have augmented reality? When talking about overlapping digital images, we can take a look at a cockpit that had one of the first improved concepts of overlapping images, where the digital images were displayed on the monitor and then reflected at a 45 degree angle over a semi-transparent and semi-reflective surface in order to allow for the observation of reality aided with images. The same technology is used in a teleprompter where a person can stare directly into the camera and read the text being reflected off a display. However, in the case of the cockpit, real images are overlapped without the need to include both eyes for perception and lacking the creation of virtual images. This came to prominence in the Sword of Democles project developed by Ivan Sutherland and his colleagues back in 1968. That offered two distinct images projected in front of both eyes that overlapped with their observation of the real world around them. However, Sutherland was developing this as a part of his vision about the ultimate display, where he specified that the ultimate display would of course be a room within which the computer can control the existence of matter, with such examples as the holodeck from the Star Trek series, where the matter is something people can interact with. The interaction concept was exactly what Myron Kruger wanted to implement in his project, Video Place, in 1985. His idea with the video place was the creation of an artificial reality that surrounded the users and responded to their movements and actions without being encumbered by the use of goggles or gloves. The video place used projectors, video cameras, special purpose hardware, and on-screen silhouettes of the users to place the users within an interactive environment. Finally, we come to the 1993, when the term augmented reality first appeared in a paper done by Mizell and Caudel dealing with the application in airplane industry, placing the focus on precise cable position within the airplane electronics board, which is when we can introduce the term of augmented reality. In order to finally define it, we can take a look at this book and see that augmented reality, AR, aims to present information that is directly registered to the physical environment, and AR goes beyond mobile computing in that it bridges the gap between virtual world and the real world, both spatially and cognitively. Nowhere can we see anything related to the visual appearance, only that it deals with bridging the gap between the real and the virtual through the physical space and our perception. Based on all the previously mentioned things, we arrive at this highly cited paper by Azuma called A Survey of Augmented Reality, where he addresses the visual aspect in this part here, saying that some researchers define AR in a way that requires the use of head-mounted display. To avoid limiting AR to specific technologies, the survey defines AR as any system that has the following three characteristics. Combines real and virtual, is interactive in real time, and is registered in three dimensions. Now that these three areas of interest are vast to explore for this short video, so we will just focus on the concepts behind it without going into detail for each. When talking about the real and the virtual, we have discussed the difference in our first session regarding extended reality, defining real as something that has substance and virtual something that has the appearance of having substance. However, within the scope of augmented reality, real can refer to real images that tend to become more complex and to sample and synthesize more data around the users, starting with photographs or pictures and going to motion pictures or films that can be captured in real time and what is more that can capture a larger visual angle of 360 degrees before being able to capture data within the invisible electromagnetic spectrum as well as positions in the space around us. These videos can be superimposed onto real images or combined to create virtual images through human perception. The other topic is the interaction portion as an important criteria in the virtuality continuum. Here, in augmented reality, the way we communicate or interact with the computer is given by the keyboard at first, writing computer code, after which we turn to the computer mouse with a graphic user interface. And even though this is still in use today, new ways of interaction are explored through speech with various virtual assistants and even moving to gesture and thought interactions to speed up the communication and make the process more intuitive.
The 3D registration is the core of the AR system responsible for evaluating the AR system performance, mainly how to solve the real-time mapping of spatial data from the real world into the virtual world shown through different mediums. As this is a vast topic, we will cover it briefly here with most important examples, starting with AR Quake. AR Quake is an augmented reality version of the popular Quake game, overlaying computer-generated information onto the real world produced by a wearable computer lab in 2002. The integration of virtual elements, interaction, and tracking is present here, with the optical overlay being handled by a specific proprietary software. However, in 1999, AR Toolkit was released as an open source computer tracking library for creation of strong augmented reality applications that overlays virtual imagery on the real world. In order to create strong augmented reality, it uses video tracking capabilities that calculate the real camera position and orientation relative to square physical markers or natural feature markers in real time. Once the real camera position is known, a virtual camera can be positioned at the same point and 3D computer graphics models can be drawn, exactly overlaid on the real marker. So AR Toolkit solves two of the key problems in augmented reality, viewpoint tracking and virtual object interaction. This SDK was upgraded to AR Toolkit Plus for the use in mobile phones, utilizing a new feature that most smartphones had, which is an EMU, an inertial measuring unit. With this sensor, it became possible to track the acceleration and hence the speed and position of points in space, which made tracking much easier with diminished errors in calculation. One way of tracking these points was the PATAM, or the Parallel Tracking and Mapping, introduced in 2007 by Klein and Murray, which is a camera tracking system that requires no markers, pre-made maps, known templates, or inertial sensors. It is a part of the SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping methods, that are necessary in these types of situations. However, PATAM is only one type of tracking without preparation in unknown environments. Another approach was done by the Kinetic Fusion system developed by Newcomb in 2011, which builds detailed 3D models from inexpensive depth sensors, as shown in this example here. Based on this brief overview of 3D registration development, we can take a look at some augmented reality types related to the three criteria we have mentioned prior. The first one is projection AR, also known as spatial augmented reality, or projection mapping which is a type of augmented reality that uses projectors to overlay digital content onto physical objects or surfaces in the real world. It involves the projection of computer-generated visuals onto the real-world surfaces to create the illusion of interactive and dynamic augmented environments. In most cases, they are dynamic, but sometimes they can be static, like for use in retail and advertising, in order to enhance products, displays, and create engaging shopping experiences. It allows for large-scale immersion, realistic integration, and dynamic and interactive experiences that can accommodate flexible criteria, like in this case of high-colored sand dunes. The other type is recognition-based AR that functions by recognizing an important feature in the real world and positioning a virtual model in reference to it. The first approach is marker-based AR, which relies on identification of markers or user-defined images to function. Markers are distinct patterns that cameras can easily recognize and process and are visually independent of the environment around them. A simple Wuforia tutorial can yield the result of placing virtual content onto a marker, but creative exploration of various markers and their interdependency can really push the limits of what can be done with marker-based AR. In this example, we can see the use of several markers that contribute to the main virtual element of the house causing it to be larger or smaller depending on the amount of money that is added, which is to say depending on the correlation of the markers in the vicinity of one another. A whole different approach is the markerless augmented reality type that doesn't require image recognition to produce visual effects. Instead, the technology uses a device's camera, location software, and accelerometer to detect positional information, including the orientation of different objects and the space between them. Exploring further within this approach is also possible, paying attention that proper SLAM approaches are used that track the proper position on the virtual map, or track the real-time lighting of an interior scene and adjust accordingly with the AR virtual models that exist. A third type is based on position or location, utilizing the GPS coordinates. With location-based AR, the content is fixed to a specific physical space, 
It maps the real world environment and defines visual positions in your surroundings. Once your device detects a match with the map location, it superimposes digital imagery accordingly. Pokemon Go is the most well-known example of location-based augmented reality. The final type of AR is the superimposition, which involves either partial or full replacement of an original view of an object with an augmented view of the same object, as can be seen here in the analog example. In this type of AR, object recognition plays a vital role because an app cannot replace an original object with an augmented one if it cannot identify the original object. This type of AR has been popularized by social platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, and other by using filters. However, superimposition AR has found its application in architectural scale models as well, as can be seen here in this example, which first requires object recognition and then the overlapping of virtual images to showcase the interior equipped with see-through window panes and interaction widgets. Now, even though all the types of AR we've mentioned have a visual component attached to it, we can still take the base concepts and apply it to different senses. For example, triggering a haptic device when a certain direction is chosen or receiving auditory cues while traveling through different locations. So within contemporary virtuality continuum, we can conclude by saying that augmented reality holds the promise of creating direct, automatic, and actionable links between the physical world and electronic information. These types of information would be aligned, correlated, and stabilized within the user's real-world perception in a spatially contextual and intelligent manner. But this is just a definition based on the previously stated literature overview. What would you say is augmented reality? Is it purely connected to visual, or is there any application that can accommodate other senses? Which AR type do you find most useful in the field you're interested in? Let us know in the comments below. If you found the video helpful, consider subscribing as we are on our way to reach our first 1,000 members. And if you're interested, check out some of the other videos from the Extended Reality Lecture Series. I thank you for your time and hope to see you in the next video. Bye.